Hello, I'm Jeff from uh, New Life Ministries in Hammond, Indiana, and we're glad that you're here today. I have a question for you. What is the most popular evangelism verses that we hear? <laughs> Can somebody give me a chapter and a verse? John 3.16. Uh, no, evangelism. <laughs> evangelism verse. Can anybody tell me? Well, let's see. I'll give you a hint. It's in Matthew. Yeah, Anybody know what chapter? Yeah, I need chapter and verse. Anybody know 28, that? 28, 19. 28, 19, 20. Guess what? I'm not preaching on that. All right. <laughs> I'm preaching on Matthew chapter 10. Let's go there. <laughs> and I'm contrary to what I normally do, I just thought this this particular translation was a very good translation for what I'm about to preach on today. I usually use the King James, <coughs> but one of the ones that I really like after that is uh, it's called the Holman Christian Standard Bible, uh, or just CSB, either one that you have. So it's to me it closely aligns with what we're talking about today. Now in Matthew chapter 10. The disciples have just been called, pretty much, okay? The reason why you know, because when you get into chapter 10 and verse 2, it lists all 12 of the disciples. Any chapters before that doesn't list all 12 of them, okay? What I want to do is concentrate on verse 1. Now, who thinks they can go out and go witnessing right now? Who can tell somebody about Jesus if you walked right out on that sidewalk out there? And you ask them about Jesus Christ and do they have him in his heart? Who can do it? Okay. Guess what? Not just three of us. All of us can do it. Matter of fact, it's commanded. Not only commanded, he's also already equipped us. Why? Because let's read chapter 1 of verse 10. Or chapter 10, verse 1. I got it backwards. Summoning his 12 disciples... Now, stop right there. Are you a disciple or just a child of God? Are you a disciple or are you just a pew warmer? He says 12 disciples. What are disciples? Those are all people becoming little Jesuses. Okay? A, a, a disciplined one of the things of Jesus Christ. So, for the ones that didn't raise their hands, you're not taking advantage of what's given, what's been given to you when you got saved. Do you know that? That there's, it's just the same thing. If you know that you want a million dollars, but you don't have the the raff, or the the uh, lottery ticket, you be you be kicking yourself in the rear, wouldn't you? If you played the lottery. Well, you got something better than the lottery. You got the power of Jesus Christ. So why are you not kicking yourselves in the rear about this? Why am I not kicking myself in the rear about it more often? You are, if you ask Jesus Christ in your heart, you're a child of God. Now, every child of God, there was a lot of people that followed Jesus, but not all of them were disciples. Were they? Why? Why? Because they didn't want to be like Jesus. Why? Because they were lazy. It says so. I'll get to it further along. We as Christians are commanded to give people the cure for sin. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have a master's degree. You don't even have to have a bachelor's degree. You don't even have to have an associate's degree. You don't have to have a high school diploma. You don't have to have a kindergarten diploma. So if it's that easy, why are we not doing it? Ain't that right, Brother Larry? Both of them? If it's that easy, why are we not telling people about Jesus? Anybody give me a reason why you're not telling me about Je telling other people about Jesus? No, because nobody wants to say it. Fear. Huh? Fear. Fear is one. That's a, that's a good one. Inadequacy. There's no inadequacy. They think they have it. They think they're fearful. It's what you put in your head, yourself, that puts that forward. I was fearful all the time. I was fearful I'd never get married. 
I was fearful that I would never get out of college. I was fearful that I would never this or never that until start things started happening. I changed. Guess what you have to do? You have to change your mind. How do you change your mind? With facts. How do you change your mind? With facts, not feelings. You change your mind with facts, not feelings. Just because you fear witnessing to somebody doesn't prove the fact. The fact proves whether you're willing to do it or not, or fearful or not, or anything. Because Jesus didn't say nothing about fear with witnessing. You don't have to be fearful to witness. That's not a prerequisite. Inaccuracy? The woman at the well just got saved. And she hurried up and ran and told the people right after the well. Didn't she? Was she inadequate? Some people would say, yeah. Well, she didn't have a Bible degree. The woman at the well went and told all the people what Jesus said about her. Come and let me tell you what Jesus told me about me. So if you're fearful, tell people about Jesus, what Jesus has done for you and what he knows about you. Guess what? You get to talk about me, yourself. Isn't that great? I, that was a revelation to me to, even this morning. And I've been a Christian since I was 12. And I've been to Bible school and I've done all this stuff. But guess what? He says, fear is not an excuse. Inadequacy is not an excuse. You look at the people that Jesus talked to. You look at the Ethiopian unit uh, after Philip went to him. What did he say immediately? What hinders me from being baptized? That doesn't sound like fear to me, does it? What's that sound like? Great expectations. I'm ready now for the Lord. If we're truly saved as Christians... And we love our Lord as much as we do. And we love our friends and our family and our co-workers and maybe even our enemies, which we're supposed to do. Should fear be the priority in our lives? I don't hear nothing. Should fear be a priority in our lives? It should not. Okay, what about inaccuracy? Should that be the reason why we don't witness? According to the Bible? No. All right. I've stuck my foot in my mouth many a times in my life. Get over it. Fix it and start all over. Because Jesus said in verse chapter 1, I could just stay on this verse all the rest of the time of my sermon. But I want to go through the whole chapter. I don't know if it'll be a two-parter, but I hope if it is, it's not going to be too far apart from the two-parter. Anyways, he says, Summoning his twelve disciples. What does the word summoning mean? Calling. Calling. There you go, Dad. It's called calling. When you're a child of God, what does the Father do? He calls you. He calls you what? If you're if you're not a Christian and your father calls you to do something, usually it's to do something, isn't it? Son, go take out the trash. Daughter, go wash the dishes or son wash the dishes. I don't want to make it a female male thing, but you know what I mean. When the Father calls you and you don't come, what does the Father do? He raises his voice. I said, come. I want you here. Come here. Like Bill, oh, who was that? Bill Cosby did on uh, Huxtable. He says to Rudy, Rudy, come here. He does it real jokingly. So if it sounds rough, I'm sorry. And then if it doesn't get if it doesn't get answered, what does God do? He could be a little rougher, right? He disciplines us. He disciplines us. There you go. It could be a swat on the butt. It could be taking away something. I hate quiet times. Quiet time is not a discipline. I don't care what anybody says. He'll discipline us. And uh, here's the thing about discipline. Discipline is not always correction. Discipline means I'm showing you how to do it right the first time. It's also instruction. Chapter 10 instructs us how to be witnesses to people. Now, I'm not going to ask for a call or show of hands, but when's the last time you witnessed to somebody? Was it yesterday? Was it this week? Okay, we're getting a little further. Was it last month? 
a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, as it fades away. The Bible says we're supposed to be witnessing when? Every single day we should be witnessing. Why does he say we can witness? Because this, if you read the rest of verse 1, it says this. He gave them. All right. The word gave. You talked about John 3.16. Okay, these are people who answered to John 3.16. Okay. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, if he gave you everlasting life, and you read in verse 10... Andrew, what does verse 10 say? What did he give them? Authority. authority. What does authority mean? Control. Power. Power. Information. Equipment. So if he gave you and me authority, and a lot of people are power hungry, but this is a different type of authority. He gave them authority. Now, if he gave, I'm giving you the pastor. This is yours. Okay, he did it to me too. He gave me the pastor. Did I want it? The first time, yes. The second and third times, not so much. But he gives it to you. Because you know what? There are things that in every church I've ever been in, every office I've ever held, Every teach, every time, every day, sometimes it seems like I was a failure. I thought I was. But it turned out not to be. I made some mistakes. Failure is when you stop trying. When you stop doing. So when you stop witnessing, oh, in a month or a year or five or ten years or you've never witnessed, they say less than... I believe it is less than 2% of people that are called themselves Christians have ever witnessed to another person about salvation. Less than 2%. So, I can venture to say most of us haven't witnessed to nobody. I can venture to say that. So he gave them authority. Now, if he gave you authority, which is power, right? What does he give you power over? Michael, what does he give you power on? Give me the first unclean one. Unclean spirits. Unclean spirits. What are unclean spirits? Demons. demons. They do exist. Hello there, internet world. The demons do exist. And they're not nice. But guess what? If you're a Christian, and more importantly, if you are a disciple, and some people never had the power because they never answered the call to be a disciple. So if you are a disciple, which means you're trying to be like Jesus, trying to be like Jesus isn't sitting in these uh, teal-colored pews on our behinds, taking in the Word, and you go home, and you shut it up, and you put it in a little cabinet, you put it in your drawer, and you're done. Is that power? Is that power? Anybody answer me? No. No, it's not power. So he gives us power over unclean spirits. What does he tell us to do with the unclean spirits, Matt? What does he tell us? To drive them out. To drive them out. I'm, I'm singling people out today because, one, you get to get on the Internet. Two... We need to put this in our head. We just don't read it. We speak it. We speak it. Guess what we do next? What are we supposed to do? Dad, do it, right? Yeah. We're supposed to do it. So, to drive them out. Does that mean, okay, well, okay. I command you, unclean spirit, to leave. No. That's the sissy way. Amen. Amen. He says, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. He said that to even Peter. I don't think he was sissified when he said it either. The little effeminate Jesus that people put on Hollywood. 
The Bible says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man, so that way he was a man's man. Okay? He wasn't wimpy. He wasn't effeminate. He wasn't compromising. If you really want to get into God's word, this is what he says, ain't it? Over any unclean spirits to drive them out. Now, Larry Evans, what does he say next to do? Heal all kinds of sicknesses and, and diseases. diseases. Okay. That takes care of the fear. That takes care of the inadequacy. Get over it. Right? Now do it. We're going to see how he does it. So if you're using fear as an excuse, Jesus gave us power. Amen? If you're using inadequacy as an excuse, does Jesus allow that excuse? No, he doesn't. He doesn't allow that excuse, but we do. Well, Brother Jeff, I just don't know. This person is an enemy, and I'm afraid to say anything to him. You know what? God will provide a way for you to speak if you truly want to speak. Amen? He will. You know why? Because what did he give them? What did he give you? Forget them. Okay? They're our grandfathers. What did he give you? If he gave it to the disciples, did he give it to you? Is your Christian? Who's a Christian here? Amen. Who's a disciple? Who's a disciple? Okay. He only gives power to people who are going to do something. Amen. If you're a disciple, he gave you that power. So, out the door, any excuses go. Now, so he equipped you. He gave you the authority. As if the President of the United States came to me, whichever president it was, they said, okay, you have the power to evangelize Hammond, Indiana, which they don't have that kind of power to give me. Only God does. Well, let's say, uh, I give you power over Hammond to get rid of all the blighted houses and all, all the people that are taking advantage of welfare and other things. I give you power to get rid of that. What do you think what I'm going to do? You think I'm just going to sit there on my laurels? And do nothing? No. So then he calls out the 12 disciples in verses uh, 2 through uh, 4. We're not going to read them. Let's go skip number 5. So power gets rid of fear. Power gets rid of inadequacy. God says, I am not the author of fear, but what? Love and peace and of a sound mind in James. <coughs> Let's go to verse 5. Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them instructions. So he gave them power. All right. What else did he give them? Instructions. instructions. Because uneducated power leads to bad consequences. Okay. Instructions without power leaves you ineffective. So you have to have both. You have to have power. You have to have the authority. But you have to know how to use that authority. Amen? So then he gives them instructions. I don't know if he sat them around a round table or had a picnic or whatever the case was, was but he gave them instructions. Amen? Amen? Okay. I'm not Jesus, but just for the biggest part of this sermon right now, just say I am Jesus at this moment. You're my 12 disciples, but we're short a few at the moment. My job is to give you instruction. First, I gave you power. Okay, Internet people don't think I'm, I call myself Jesus because I'm not. It's just an illustration. Jesus sent out his 12 after giving them power first, then instructions. He'll never send you out without his power. Number two, he'll never send you out with instructions to use that power. Now, are we supposed to use that power any old way we want? No. That's why he gave instructions. This is what you do. That's why I went to Bible college. Because I had the power to be a witness. And I witnessed a lot with my youth director. But now I needed instruction. And they gave me instruction, but I got more at the college. 
to restrain myself. Some power needs to be restrained. Not restrained in a sense of, okay, I don't want to witness nobody, but restrained in a sense is when I do witness to them, how do I witness to them? Okay? And as we know, if you've been a Christian any length of time, there's many different methods. Okay? There's many different styles. But there's only one message. And that's what we're to proclaim, that one message. Amen? And he not only gave them to proclaim the message, he gave them to the, the power to do things. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. You know, right now, you, if you are a disciple and you're willing to be used by Jesus, you have that same power. This is not a Pentecostal moment. The Pentecostal never entered the phase of this Bible until after Acts. So it's not about being a Pentecostal. It's about being a disciple of Jesus. So he sent out the twelve after giving them instructions. This is the instructions he said. Don't take the road leading to other nations. I want you to stay here. I want you to stay local. Okay. How many people have I witnessed to in my apartment complex when I was in my apartment? Uh, I think we did pretty good there. We did about six or seven that while we were living over there on Kennedy Avenue. How many people did I witness to in Snyder? Well, you know what? That's up to God, but I tried. But he said, stay close. It wasn't time to give it to the, to the Gentiles in full at this time. Jesus did address the Gentiles. Okay, so don't think Gentiles could never get saved, even before the book of Acts, because they could. They got saved in the Old Testament. They got saved while Jesus was on this earth, those that wanted to. But they didn't concentrate their efforts to the Gentiles. Though I imagine many were around when Jesus preached to the 5,000 and the 2,000. <coughs> And when he was on the Sea of Galilee, or Gethsemane, or wherever the case was, there were certainly enough Gentiles there to hear the gospel. Amen? But he said, stay focused. Stay on the locals. Okay? And don't enter Sumerian towns. Um, don't enter towns that have troubles. Okay? You know, I don't know. At this particular time, he said, just don't go to Samaria because there was the issue of being a half Jew and a half this and a half that. He says, I love these people, but we're going to stay local for now. Okay, so keep that in, in, in check. Not that he never wanted to speak to Samaritans because he spoke to Samaritan woman, right? So keep that out of the picture. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Guess what? He's making this easy. Isn't he? Because if you're going to the lost house of the sheep of Israel, what are they? Jews. They're Jews. But more importantly, what, 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 besides being Jew, what else were they? They were the lost sheep. Right. They're the same thing the disciples were. They're my neighbors. They're my co-workers. People who know me. People... If they know you well enough, know that you're a Christian. Same and that, culture. Huh? The same culture. The same culture. But he isn't talking about culture. He's talking about locality. And he's talking about your neighbors. Reach out to your neighbors. Reach out to your family first. Amen? Amen. And he told that the same thing in Matthew chapter 28. But guess what? It was well instituted way before Matthew chapter 28 was, wasn't it? It was well instituted before Jesus Christ in a physical form came during the Old Testament period. Gentiles could have been saved back then in the Old Testament. Did you know that? We think salvation was only a New Testament thing. It was not a New Testament thing. Salvation has always been available. So then he says, do this. As you go, announce this. Okay? What do we have to use to announce this? The book. Our mouths, the word of God. 
Okay, the mouth and the word of God should be natural to us. Amen? What comes out of our mouth? Blessings and cursings? <coughs> Criticisms? Barbs? Competition? No. He says, this is what I tell you to do. As you go announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. So are we supposed to be talking about the presidents and the politicians and things like that? And I, I'm saying this because I get caught up in it too, don't we, Dad? We get caught up in it. That's not our job, though. Our job isn't to go talk about our next door neighbor and what they did. Our job is not to go to somebody else and complain about another church member about what they did or didn't do. He says, go, tell them the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven was a big word back then because you know why? There were some that believed in heaven and some that didn't. But this is Jesus saying, I wish these were red letter in this Bible, but they're not. <clears throat> As you go, announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven has come near like the town crier. Remember, they didn't have newspapers back then. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have loudspeakers. They were the loudspeakers. He said this, Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those with skin diseases. The Bible and, and King James calls it leprosy, but there were other skin diseases just like there are today. Is, those are the things we're supposed to do. Drive out the demons. It's a repeat of what? Verse 1. You have received... This is... I like this. <coughs> you have received free of charge. Jesus said that. Before he died on the cross. That's important. Before he died on the cross, he said you received free of charge. Give free of charge. What's that? Treating your neighbor as yourself. Amen. That's part of the, the two commandments that Jesus said. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and, and spirit. And love your neighbor as yourself. So if you've been given freely, what are we to do freely? Give. To give. And that means salvation. And that means what we can in our own, you know, the things, the material things that God's given us. Other things. That should blow your mind. You've been given freely. But we don't want to give freely, do we? We want to put an attachment to it. We won't put a string on that dollar bill that the insurance company says, I'll give you if you if you don't have an accident. Jesus don't have strings attached, does he? Freely give, been given, give freely. Don't take a long now. Here's the other thing. And I, I, I need to do less of this. Don't take along gold or silver or copper for your money belts while you're witnessing. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt or sandals or a walking stick. For the worker is worthy of his food. What does that mean? Can somebody give me a, their definition of what you think that means? Don't worry about how you're going to get by. Trust God. Trust God. There you go. Two words. Trust God. God. Do we trust God that much? I don't you know I say. I, I don't trust Him as much as I ought to. Do you trust God that much? Sometimes we trust God that much because we're poor already. And we ain't going to get much more. Some of us we trust God because we have too much and we're afraid to get rid of it. Some of us are... They want to save for the what? The rainy day. Now, when I was in the fundamentalist circles a lot, they said, you don't need to buy insurance. God will take care of you. 
Boy, so far I've been relying on that, but I, that's not something I believe in. I would like to have the insurance so I can take care of things in my body that need help. But this is truly trusting God for me. It really is. When you enter to a town or a village, this is how you're going to be discipling. This is how you're witnessing. This is how you're going to make disciples. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy. Stay there until you leave. <clears throat> greet a household when you enter it. That means don't be rude. When you greet them, say, hello. My name is Jeff Brown. I'm just from the town over here, and uh, we have some business to take care of. Uh, we'd like to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. Is that all right? You know, sometimes you can do that. Find out if they're worthy or not. Are these people that you can stay with? God just don't want you staying with any old person. Even that. He says, stay with somebody you, you, you know they're worthy. Hopefully another what? Another what? Christian. Christian or even better? Disciple. Disciple. Okay. Create a household when you enter, or greet a household when you enter it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave the house or the town. He said, don't be rude about it. Just walk away. They don't want it. You don't have to be persistent with somebody who doesn't want something, okay? But I want to give it to you. I've heard preachers and seen preachers. I've been with preachers that they'll go to the same house 50 times. And they get the 50th, 50th same answer. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your efforts and your money or whatever else that you have. Just go off, shake the dust off their feet, pray for them. I assure you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, I still can't talk, right? Than for that town. Now, as disciples, and we're becoming little Jesuses, Oh, I ain't going to finish this chapter, I don't think. Now, to answer your uh, answer, Miss Andrea, fear. Guess what we're supposed to fear? Are we supposed to feel peop fear people? God. We're supposed to fear God, that's right. Verse 26. Therefore, don't be afraid of the people, since there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What I tell you in the dark... Speak openly. Speak in the light. What you hear in a whisper. Proclaim on the housetops. Oh, I, I tell you, especially when I was a younger kid, I admired a street preacher. I still do, because I don't get to do it as much. But you get on a state in Randolph in Chicago, and you see a street preacher in there, and they got this big megaphone. At that time, they had this big megaphone. Lots of people, most people just walk by, zoom, 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 don't pay attention to them. But you get some of them that get, you see them, they, they stop in their tracks. That's who the message is for. You know that? The message isn't for the people who won't listen. The message is for the people who will listen. The message is for everybody. <clears throat> but your job is to tell people, spread it out like seed. Broadcast it out. Some hits the ground, some hits the cement, some hits a crack in the cement, some hits the, the quarter inch of dirt that's somewhere else. Guess what? We're not responsible for all them. We're responsible for what? Spreading it. Broadcasting it. And I know because I, I, get, I get upset sometimes and I think, why aren't we getting results? But that's not my job. It's not my job. It's... God's job to get results. So I skipped. Now I want you to get a chance. Skipped about persecutions predicted. He says, people don't hate you. I'll keep it short. People hate him. They hate Jesus. That's why you can't see the name of Jesus almost anywhere anymore. But he says, here's, here's the fear. Fear God. Amen. Amen. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in a whisper, proclaim on the housetops. <coughs> if you're fearing God, the next section in chapter 10 is this. 
acknowledging Christ. There's a big difference when you say the word God than when you say Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Why? Because there's many gods. People have made many small g gods. So God isn't a big big problem for most people. But then when you go over here and you proclaim Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, everything stops, doesn't it? I'm offended. <coughs> Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. That's offensive. I don't want that. I don't want that one way. You're being, you're being intolerant. Yeah, I am. I am being intolerant. Because Jesus was intolerant because he was the way. How are you going to be intolerant when you are the only way? How can you be tolerant of somebody when you're the only way? I have to be this way. There's only one way to cure cancer. If there was only one way to cure cancer, oh, I don't want that. I want a different way. There is no different way. We are going to be intolerant. Why? We're not going to be intolerant of the person. We're going to be intolerant of, one, the message they want to give. Number two, we're going to be intolerant of the sin that they have in their lives. And I have in my life, too. Or the message that I may falsely proclaim either through non-education or willfulness, one of the two. Here's what he says. Jesus said, I didn't come here to bring peace. Now, he did come here to bring peace. How do we reconcile the peace difference? He came to reconcile and have peace between me and him. That's where the peace comes from. The peace doesn't come from him to all the world. It comes one individual at a time one individual and then when you have a community of individuals that are at peace with God guess what you're going to have you have a community at peace when you have a community at peace and it spreads out then you hopefully have a state of peace and then when that spreads out you're going to have a world full of peace but Jesus already said peace isn't going to come until I come again he said in verses I'm almost done I had to really cut this short because I had so many things that God had on my mind but he says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What is a sword? The Bible. The Bible. Not an actual sword. This is stronger than an actual sword. He said in verse 35, For I came to turn a man against his father. I don't like that. I love my father. I came for to turn a daughter against her mother. I don't like that either. Do we? I came to turn a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Well, let's see. I might put son-in-law in there, and we had a little problem for a while. That was okay, but not really. Okay, just to let you know. I came, and a man's enemies will be what? The members of his own household. household. I hate that. I love my family. I love my wife. I love my dad. I love my sisters. I love my family. But he says earlier in the chapter, I think in the section that he talks about persecution or so, you're not to love them more. You're not to love them more. You are to love them. He does not, he does not say don't love them. He doesn't say that. He says, love me more. Because if you love me more, no matter what happens, you're at peace. There are times that my dad and I are not always at peace when it comes to politics. There's times that me and my wife are not at peace because we have a difference of opinion. Whose fault is that? As the man of the house and the called one of God, I have to make peace. I have to provide the peace. The only way I can provide that peace is through who? Jesus. 
I can't do it on my own. I still want to love my family. I still want to be concerned with my co-workers and things like that. I got a new, I got a new uh, step, kind of a step mom. We're, we're only four years apart, but still. I got a step mom. I got to learn to love her and be at peace with her. That's my job. She's already made a peace with her dad, with her husband. But I need to make, if I have something wrong, we don't have nothing wrong between each other, but if we do, it's really my responsibility to make peace. It's hers too, but as the man of God that I'm supposed to be, and I try, I don't always succeed, I'm supposed to be at peace. Be at peace with God and Jesus Christ. That peace, this is called trickle-down economics, comes down to me and my family comes down from my family to other people. Peace is something that doesn't happen all at once. Boom! Everybody's got peace. That's what they were expecting Jesus to do. Come back, kill the Romans, set up his kingdom, hey! We're at peace. But they weren't at peace with Jesus. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the other people who see they, not all of them were at peace with Jesus. So that's how you witness. That's 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 evangelism 101. Be at peace with Jesus. If you're a child of God, you're to be what a, a what of God? A disciple of God. If we're to be a disciple of God, that means we're to be like who? Jesus. Jesus. And if we show others... The love of Jesus, what are we to expect? Did God bring the increase? Amen? So that's Matthew chapter 10, way before chapter 28, just right after he called the 12 disciples. All right, first thing you do, I got all 12 of you here. I'm going to sit on this stool right here and say, okay, rule number one. Blah, 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 blah. Rule number two. Instruction number one. Instruction number two. And he spent time with them. Three and a half years he spent time with them. That's a lot of time. That's a college degree these days. It is. It's a bachelor's degree. He gave them the bachelor's degree of evangelism as they lived with him for three and a half years and walked with him and struggled with him and went in a boat with him and they went across the sea with him. A lot of tough times during those times. So, what did Paul do when he got struck on the road to Damascus? He spent three and a half years, too, studying. He, had, he was the smartest Pharisee of them all, but guess what he had to do? Turn everything around and head the opposite direction. So, I hope that we all do that, too. And God bless you. And God bless your witnessing. Amen. Um, 